It was around April of 45 BC, and the great Roman civil war was over. At last, Caesar could turn away from war and focus on the politics of the Republic. A true politician, Caesar believed that the power of the Republic was its common people, rather than the aristocracy as the Optimates believed. The extent to which he really believed in these ideals has been debated for centuries, and he has been variously viewed as a military tyrant, a despotic demagogue, a benevolent dictator, a would-be saviour of the Republic, and a populist champion of the people. In this episode, we shall look at the reforms enacted by Caesar throughout his career and allow you to decide which view you agree with. Do you want to enact reforms like Caesar? Become the saviour or the tyrant of your own unique civilization? The sponsor of this video, Humankind, will give you an opportunity to do just that. Humankind is a turn-based historical strategy game from Amplitude Studios and Sega that you can purchase on Steam, the Epic Store, Stadia or Xbox Game Pass. In Humankind, you'll be creating your own history by making a unique civilization from a combination of more than 60 historical cultures. Start as a tribe in the Neolithic era, transition to the ancient period as the mighty Romans, become the classical era Mayans, add Umayyad civilizational traits in medieval, and round it all up with British attributes in the early modern period. There are near endless combinations of civilizations. In Humankind, you'll face historical events, take impactful moral decisions, make scientific breakthroughs, discover the natural wonders of the world, or build the most remarkable creations of humanity. Each game element is historically authentic, and you decide how to combine them to build your own vision of the world. Every great deed you accomplish, every moral choice you make, every battle you win will build your fame. The player with the most fame will win the game. Unlike many other 4X games, Humankind does not only have a great strategic layer, but also offers very interesting tactical battles that take place right on the map. So what are you waiting for? Create your avatar and lead your empire, customize it as you progress, and challenge strangers and friends alike in multiplayer games up to 8 players. Support us and buy this genuinely unique game via the link in the description. By the time of Caesar's first consulship in 59 BC, Pompey had long struggled to push legislation that would give land to his veterans. Caesar proposed a bill that would achieve this, while also including measures that would distribute land to the urban poor of Rome. The Gracchi brothers, almost 70 years earlier, had tried to carry out a similar proposal, distributing public land to the poor, eventually resulting in their deaths at the hand of the Senate. Caesar, however, had learned from their example. His proposal to the Senate would provide land for 20,000 of Rome's poor, without any financial cost to the Senate or the wealthy landowners. The riches Pompey had taken from the East would be used to fund the reform, and land would be bought from the owners at the price it had been assessed at in the tax lists, ensuring fairness. A board of 20 would oversee the redistribution, with Caesar exempting himself from the board to ensure it would not be biased. When the bill was put to the Senate, it was apparently so watertight that none could criticize it. Nevertheless, they did not pass it, with stiff opposition coming from influential men such as Cato, Cicero and Caesar's consular colleague Bibulus. Caesar read the bill to the people, where it received huge public approval. Still, the Senate refused to pass the bill, obfuscating and delaying constantly. Eventually, Caesar requested the help of Pompey and Crassus, both of whom publicly supported the bill. With their support assured, Caesar decided to bypass the Senate, officially proposing the bill to the Comitia, an assembly of citizens. Bibulus tried to use all the political tricks in the book to stop the assembly but was assaulted by the people and forced to retreat to his house. The bill finally was passed, and all senators were bound by oaths to uphold it. Shortly after the passing of this bill, according to both Appian and Cassius Dio, a man called Lucius Vettius attempted to assassinate both Caesar and Pompey. He was caught and when interrogated, said he had been put up to it by either Bibulus, Cicero and Cato, or Cicero and Lucullus, depending on the source, all of whom were adamant optimates. 
Vettius was then killed in the night while in prison before any more could be learned from him. Roman historians were extremely critical of Caesar for this bill. Dio claims that Caesar only proposed it as a favour to Pompey and Crassus, to help win public support, and so lay the groundwork for the first triumvirate. While Plutarch says the law was becoming not for a consul, but for a most radical tribune of the plebs. They both see the bill as being designed purely to win popular approval. Caesar certainly did want to assure his supporters that he was a man of action and in control, and so the ancient historians are right in part. The bill did indeed win Caesar and his co-triumvirates a lot of popular support, thus helping Caesar settle political debts with Pompey and Crassus. It is also important to note that Caesar did abuse the republican system in order to get the bill passed, overruling both the senate and a fellow consul. However, it is also true that this kind of land reform was badly needed in Rome and did benefit thousands of its poorer citizens. Furthermore, Caesar already had a history of supporting land reform, having supported a similar but failed bill in 63 BC. Caesar was also playing a seriously risky game by proposing the legislation. Similar laws had resulted in the deaths of the Gracchi and would result in an attempt on his own life and one is forced to wonder if there was not a less risky way of winning public support if that was the only motivation. It's also worth noting that the Roman voting system heavily favoured the rich, the poor having a comparatively small amount of influence in voting. As a result, it is debatable just how much power Caesar would really have achieved by passing a bill that would benefit the poorest. It's also worth remembering that Dio and Plutarch were both parts of the aristocracy of the empire, a highly conservative body, and so criticism of radical populist reforms would be expected from them. Unfortunately, we do not have any written histories from people in the class that would benefit from Caesar's reforms, but it's hard to imagine that they would agree with the two historians. After the Battle of Thapsus, Caesar was named dictator for 10 years, as well as being given tribunal and censorial powers, effectively giving him ultimate power over the Republic, and he immediately began the tasks of reassuring the people that the crisis was over and stabilizing the government. Huge games were held, including elephants and mock naval battles at colossal expense. He received considerable criticism for this from some of the public, who thought that they were in poor taste, but they were largely successful in calming and winning over the populace. Through his censorial powers, which allowed him to pass laws regarding morality, he regulated the expenditure of the richest of Rome's citizens and gave incentives for people to have more children and larger families to try and boost Rome's diminished population. Augustus would later pass similar legislation, and Caesar's passing of these laws can be viewed as a precursor to the autocratic regime of emperors. On the other hand, republican virtues had always valued the rejection of luxury goods and having large families, so Caesar can equally be seen as doing nothing more than trying to reinstate core republic traditions. Shortly after this, Caesar would fight the remnants of the Pompeian faction in Spain before returning to Rome around April 45 BC, having finally won the civil war. Upon his arrival back in Italy, he immediately retired his favourite 10th legion and the 13th. Most of Caesar's other veteran legions had already been retired, but the significance of demobilising these two was vast. The 10th was renowned as Caesar's favourite, and had fought in almost every major battle of the civil war. The 13th was no less prestigious, and had been the legion that had first crossed the Rubicon with Caesar. His message was clear, the war was over and Caesar wanted peace. This was reinforced by his rejection of the offer of having a bodyguard, saying, it is better to die once than to be always expecting death. When he returned to Rome, he assured the Senate that he would hold no grudges and that he would not carry out the prescriptions that had defined the dictatorship of Sulla, saying, The man who recklessly abuses his power on absolutely all occasions finds for himself neither genuine goodwill nor certain safety, 
but through accorded false flattery in public, is secretly plotted against. I shall be, not your master, but your champion, not your tyrant, but your leader. Some senators and politicians who had been exiled during the civil war were recalled by Caesar, even some who had been exiled from crimes such as bribery. All those who had taken up arms against him were publicly forgiven and granted immunity, with scrolls that were found in the Pompeian camps after Pharsalus and Thapsus being burnt, along with any copies, to ensure that no later charges could be brought against him. Men who had been in positions of power in the Pompeian faction were welcomed back into the Senate, and some, such as Cassius and Brutus, were given highly important magisterial positions. For those that had died in the war with family, money was given to their wives to ensure that they and their children would be able to sustain themselves. He even went so far as to have statues of Pompey that were torn down during the civil war restored. Regarding these actions, historians have been largely in agreement. One of Caesar's most admirable traits was his mercy and clemency. Dio, often one of his harsher critics, says that in doing so, he put the reputation of Sulla to shame and built for himself a reputation for bravery and goodness. Both he and Plutarch also agree that, whether Caesar was right or wrong in his actions, he did bring much needed peace and stability to the Republic, even for just a short while. Nevertheless, some have been more questioning of these actions. Cicero, in his second Philippic, highlights how Caesar's clemency effectively kept his enemies indebted to him. Caesar should also be perhaps criticized for recalling those convicted of bribery. An argument could be made that Caesar was looking to start from a clean slate, but his recalling of these men showed a disregard for the legal jurisdiction of the state, as well as fueling rumors of him being bribed in turn in order to recall them. Though Caesar is occasionally categorized as a military dictator, the disbanding of his legions and refusal of a bodyguard make the issue arguable. One of the hallmarks of a military dictatorship is having an armed bodyguard that can then be used for intimidation. Caesar did not have this, and he also did not use his army as a threat to his rule, another hallmark of a military dictatorship. To say that Caesar achieved power through military force is certainly accurate. To say that he maintained power through military force, however, is debatable. While dictator, he also made significant other reforms that largely benefited the masses. The dole had previously been distributed to 320,000, many of whom did not actually need it, putting a strain on the supply. Caesar reduced this number to 150,000 of Rome's poorest citizens. He also began the repopulating of Carthage and Corinth, sending 80,000 citizens there with plots of land assigned to them. Medics and teachers of arts were given automatic citizenship to entice more of them to come to Rome. Debt had been a huge issue in Rome for a while now, particularly throughout the civil war. To address this, Caesar ordered that all debts must be repaid, but only at a rate proportional to the indebted person's wealth to try and curb any usury. Were these the actions of a demagogue or a man who honestly believed in giving more rights and freedoms to the people? No one can truly say for sure, but the interpretation of later historians often reveals more about their own politics than Caesar's. Certainly, arguments for both sides can be made. Having served as caster, praetor, and propraetor in Hispania, Caesar was well aware of the level of corruption in the governance of the provinces, and knew from personal experience how powerful governors could be. As such, while consul, he also introduced a bill addressing these issues. The bill prohibited governors from accepting bribes in regards to administering justice, fixed the amount of staff they could have so as to better control their expenses, and protected their subjects from having extortionate tributes demanded of them. Furthermore, it required that each governor produce three copies of their financial accounting, making it harder for the power of a pro-magistrate to be abused, and easier for it to be found out and evidenced if it was. As dictator, he would add a law explicitly limiting pro-praetors to one year in office and pro-consuls to two. 
Caesar also took steps to integrate the provinces more into the Republic, extending citizen rights to those living in Cisalpine Gaul, and began the process of fully integrating the province. Caesar's motivation for passing these reforms may have been purely a desire to limit corruption in office. At the same time, it can equally be said that Caesar was trying to stop anyone from following in his footsteps and rivaling his own position of power. It is certainly true to some extent, as is noted by Dio. Caesar was right to be cautious though. For the past few decades, arguably the biggest threat that the Republic had faced had come from its own governors being vested with too much power, eventually growing so powerful that they could not be controlled. Such had been the case with Sulla, Pompey, and himself. Reforms that checked this power were long overdue. The extension of citizen rights to Cisalpine Gaul, and beginning to integrate the province, may only have been intended by Caesar to further increase his base of support, or may have been more altruistic. It is certainly true, however, that these reforms were once again also long overdue. Despite its huge gains since the Punic Wars, the Roman Republic had still not adapted to its new size, still largely functioning as the local agrarian-based power it had been 300 years ago, rather than the Mediterranean-wide superpower it now was. This dissolving of the line between Romans and Provincials would be continued by Augustus and was crucial in providing stability to the Empire. The Senate had been massively depleted, many of its members dying throughout the Civil War. Caesar addressed this by enrolling many new members, increasing the number from around 400 to 900, including ex-soldiers, sons of freedmen, and some men from provinces. In a similar vein, Caesar also increased the number of magistrate offices, specifically those in the provinces. The number of praetors was increased, eventually increasing from 8 originally to 16, and increasing the number of caesters from 20 to 40. These two magistrates were some of the most important for provincial governance, praetors often being given full control of a province, while caesters acted as their assistants. The last major reform to the magistrates had occurred under Sulla almost 40 years earlier. Since then, huge expansions had been made, particularly by Caesar and Pompey, but no constitutional changes had been made to accommodate this growing empire. Caesar's reforms addressed this, increasing the pool of candidates for provincial governors, as well as further distributing power across a wider base. The number of aediles was also increased, adding two to specifically oversee the Roman grain doll. Though nominally these magistrates were voted for by the public, it was Caesar who nominated them. This was arguably the clearest example of tyranny that Caesar manifested while dictator, though it could also be argued that he may only have planned to nominate magistrates in the short term in order to stabilize politics after the civil war, and would have eventually abandoned the practice. More contemporary historians of Caesar are critical of a number of these reforms. Dio says that many of the men included in the Senate were unworthy of their position. He also argues that Caesar's increasing of the size of the Senate and the number of magistrates was primarily because it allowed him a longer list of political positions which he could hand out to his allies, cronies and others to whom he owed political favours, filling positions of power with his partisans. He also suggests that the increased number of governors was to stop any man from gaining too much power and challenging his position. It is perhaps worth noting here that Dio was not against the idea of a dictator per se. In his words, monarchy has an unpleasant sound but is a most practical form of government. However, he did believe that the democratic elements of the Republic were a weakness and the power of the masses was a dangerous thing that should be avoided. Therefore, while some of Dio's observations may be accurate in part, they are also clouded by Dio's inherent cynicism of democratic government. Nonetheless, in some aspects, it could be argued that on this point Caesar was ahead of his time. During the Empire, men from all over the Empire would be inducted into the Senate, no matter what province they had come from. It was restricted by money, but not by geography. 
Caesar seems to have laid the groundwork for this being the case, being the first to introduce any provincials into the Senate. While it's certainly true that Caesar did put many of his allies into the Senate and magistrate positions, it also has to be recognized that Caesar also inducted many Optimates into the same positions, even those who had been his enemy. Cicero's earlier criticism that Caesar did this to keep his enemies on side does hold some weight, but the argument can also be made that his reasoning is circular, in that Caesar would have been equally criticized for only having allies inducted into positions of power. Caesar had a number of other huge projects planned. The sources differ slightly on exactly in what order Caesar planned these campaigns, but all agree that he planned invasions of Parthia and Dacia and had begun the process of assembling the supplies and men for this. Plutarch claims that he also planned to effectively circle Europe after campaigning in Parthia, fighting through the Caucasus, Scythia, Germany, and then back to Italy through Gaul. He also had huge construction projects planned, including digging a canal through the Isthmus of Corinth, draining the marshes of Pometium and Setia, which would provide farmland for thousands, as well as expand the harbour at Ostia and constructing moles to make the approach into the port safer. All these plans were put into motion, but Caesar would not live to see any of them come to fruition. While Caesar had been busy reforming the constitution, others had been busy planning his assassination. But that is a story for another video, which will be released soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.